It is now my opportunity and, in fact, my joy to present to you this year's diocesan address from your bishop. This is a canticle that if you are someone who uh, prays the daily office, morning prayer, you will know it. If we could please stand and offer this together to God. <laughs> Offering together, splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord, our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne, and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor, forever and evermore. Please be seated. I chose to begin this time with this canticle because it honestly represents both my prayer and my vision for the Diocese of Central Florida, that we would be a family of people that represent every tribe, tongue, family, and nation, standing together in the inheritance that we have received to be that kingdom of priests, men and women who are both receiving the very power of the Holy Spirit in their lives and are being channels for that power, both in intercessory prayer and in service to the people that God sends our way. More on that later, but I really wanted to frame what I brought to you today in those words. I have to tell you that 2018 has been a year of enormous change, a breakneck pace, and at least on my part, actually a year marked by a deep and lingering spiritual hunger. In his opening diocesan address to the first convention of the Diocese of Central Florida in 1969, Bishop Henry Laudit sounded the call for missions, for evangelism, calling the diocese to be, quote unquote, a servant church. In his opening address to the special convention of the Diocese of Central Florida in 1970, Bishop William H. Falwell, and yes, he did ordain me to the priesthood, 1977 All Saints Winter Park, where I was serving as youth director and assistant. Uh, Bishop Falwell edited, uh, echoed Bishop Laudit's call to missions, especially in its call to racial equality and financially supporting the Episcopal Church vigorously and generously. Even though that was a long time ago, isn't it clear? Some things have not changed. What has changed, what feels most obvious to me, is that the fruit of setting mission as a front and center priority is, in fact, being felt across the diocese. I see it in our ordination process. I see it in the people who are being raised up for ordination. Over the course of my last seven years as bishop, 137 people have been ordained. In 2018, I ordained eight people to the priesthood and 11 people to the perpetual diaconate. We presently have 49 people in our ordination process, 24 women, 25 men. So yes, Barry, we do ordain women. <laughs> Younger people are being attracted to ordination, bringing the median age of our parochial clergy down significantly. We now have more women and more people of color serving in our congregations than we had when I first began. We continue to get inquiries from across the church, both from people seeking ordination as well as those seeking a place to serve. We are known nationally as a diocese that cares for each other, especially as one that places relationships above theological or liturgical divisions. We are known as a diocese that is growing, one of the few that in fact are, and are seeking to make room for new leaders, especially women and people of color. 
Presently, we have 18 non-Anglo people either ordained since I arrived or presently in our ordination process. While there have been a number of clergy transitions with seven congregations hosting celebrations of new ministry for their new priests, one transition has been felt by all of us in a very particular way, and that is the calling of Canon Timothy Nunez to serve as rector of Church of the Good Shepherd in Lake Wales. Tim has been appropriately feted and roasted by his fellow diocesan staff. Here is a quote from the resolution honoring Canon Tim that was read tongue in cheek at the staff party that it was at, at Laura Lee and ours home. Whereas the Diocese of Central Florida gives thanks to God, yeah, we made him embarrassing. <laughs> For the faithful, compassionate, and pun filled service of the Reverend Kenneth Timothy Nunez, whereas he being aware of our heartfelt gratitude for his example as a road warrior traversing hurricanes, garbage falling from trucks that actually happened to him on the road, <laughs> broken windshields and near-death experiences on I-4, whereas he scaled the heights of culinary excellence with his patronage of Wendy's, Taco Bell, Subway's, <laughs> Beefy King, and Shannon's Cafe, whereas he manifested his inherent enthusiasm for people by never meeting a stranger, not knowing the definition of a brief conversation, starting the day with hugs for all, and displaying a shade of red which give Rudolph's nose a run for its money when he's embarrassed, whereas he demonstrated an unwavering discipleship through his love for King Louis IX, C.S. Lewis, University of Florida Gators, and Jesus Christ, not necessarily in that order of priority, <laughs> where he has blessed his, whereas he has blessed it, his many roles as canon to the ordinary, intake officer, testifier at trials, registered agent, recovering CPA, husband, father, grandfather, son, brother, friend, and child of God. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the staff of the Diocese of Central Florida express their deep appreciation for Canon Tim, adopted December 14, 2008, in Orlando, Florida. Tim, stand up. Numerous congregations have appreciated Tim's leadership, especially in the search process of calling a new priest. Tim has been a colleague, a prayer supporter, a kind and thoughtful pastor, and a pun master without peer. Thank you, Tim. Good Shepherd Lake Wales is blessed to have you. So your canon to the ordinary leaves, what do you do? Well, I want to tell you that Canon Holcomb and I have assembled an outstanding team to work with our churches as we conduct our search for a new canon to the ordinary. We actually have three former canons to the ordinary in our diocese. They are Ernie Bennett, supposedly retired, uh, <laughs> Dan Smith of Holy Cross Sanford, and Bill Yates, interim head of Camp Wingman. Each of them are working directly with Canon Holcomb and I to serve congregations in rector searches, internal difficulties, and overall pastoral support. Honestly, I, I couldn't ask for a better team, and I'm grateful to each one of them, especially when I get their insightful reports. I must tell you, I sleep better at night, knowing that God has given us such excellent leadership literally across the diocese. When I speak of excellent leadership, I would be grossly, well, a lot of things, <laughs> if I failed to include our entire diocesan staff. Only God knows the heroic sacrifices they make regularly and gladly, the laughter and camaraderie that we share, and the thoughtfulness that continues to mark our life together. Thank you very much, Sarah Caprani, my executive assistant, Canon Holcomb, these days canon for just about everything, 
Christie, all day Archdeacon, Marilyn Lang, all around executive to just about everything, assistant. Ellen Seeley, assistant to Canon Holcomb. Earl Pickett, chief financial officer. Council, Council Wooten and Bill Grimm, our chancellors. Beverly Jennings, assistant to Earl Pickett. Eric Perez, who manages the front of the house, very important. Kristen Knox, youth consultant. And Wendy Leach, who now heads our communications team. I want to tell you, I love our team. And they serve each other and the diocese with great distinction. And thank you very, very much to all of you. I see, I see change happening in both cl church closures and church plants. In 2018, the diocese closed St. Anne's Wachula, St. Stephen's Silver Spring Shores, and St. David's Lakeland. All church closures are tragic, even when the forces that brought about that closure are beyond anyone's personal control. The absence of population growth, a long history of failing to bring in new people, financial struggles have contributed to many of these closures. Usually a church closure is at least 10 years in the making. It is worth it for clergy and vestry in each congregation to look at their own numbers and learn from these examples because no congregation is immune from the possibility of a downturn. Most of us would rather ignore the warning signs and often do, particularly if we see our friends sitting with us in the pews. But even financial or numeric stability is not a safe place because it is never permanent. The harsh truth is this, Either you are growing or you are already deteriorating. There is no middle ground. That said, downturns are not inevitable predictors of closure. Take note. Instead, downturns are opportunities for creative leadership. But solutions to a downturn are often found in quote-unquote disruptive leadership, to quote Canon Holcomb, that digs deep to get at the real facts of what actually is happening and then seek the Lord of the harvest for his plans for the future. I could tell many stories of churches that in fact are turning around, but I want to especially commend the Canon Caroline Biggs at Christ the King Lakeland and Tom Phillips at Incarnation of Oviedo for examples of extraordinary growth. During the three and a half tenures of Carolyn Biggs at Christ the King Lakeland, church attendance has increased 100% from approximately 40 to 80. And at Incarnation Oviedo, church attendance has tripled from 40 to 130 in about eight months that Tom has served there as priest. Our ch new church plant in Bethesda at, called Bethesda at Lake Nona has gone from nothing, I mean there was nothing there, to 45 regular worshipers and plans were underway for the diocese to partner with Ascension to release Father Matt Ainsley to a new place being called All Souls in the community near w Winter Garden that didn't used to exist called Horizons West. It must be said that numeric growth is not the sine qua non of church health especially in areas where there is significant population downturn. Faithfulness to Jesus is what ultimately matters. But it must be said that the Jesus we worship has sent and continues to send his disciples out into the harvest field. A church that is not sending, sowing, and yes, perhaps from time to time, reaping, especially in areas where there is demographic population growth, is missing one of the central teachings of the New Testament. Frankly, if we're not teaching evangelism and discipleship in a way that continues to bring more people into the kingdom of God, we have missed one of the central tenets of what it means to be church in the New Testament. And there is, in fact, no substitute. Canterbury Retreat and Conference Center is now under the able leadership of Mr. Chalmers Morse. Chalmers, where are you? Please stand. <laughs> Chalmers has been a resident in Vero Beach and is, in fact, a parishioner with his wife. 
at Trinity Church, though the roots of his family go back to the late 1800s in Winter Park. He has significant experience in high-end hotel renovation, has a superb eye for detail, and is a humble, thoughtful, and prayerful leader. I am thrilled that he is here, and I encourage you to meet him. Expect big and positive changes at Canterbury. I see changes happening at our general convention. Our deputation did an outstanding job. It would not be an overstatement to say that our diocesan team was at the hub, along with the Diocese of Dallas and others, in organizing and meeting with communion partner leaders, as well as working across the aisle, especially in contentious issues. I mean, they were just everywhere all the time. I'd get texts. Um, our team, along with others, made a positive difference in the outcome of our convention and a strong and prayerful witness to the gospel. The Diocese of Central Florida continues to be known as a well-informed, active, and articulate deputation. One of the many things that happened at our last convention, just this past summer, was the passage of B012, a resolution calling for a provision to be made for the availability of same-sex marriages in every diocese. You should know that that was actually a substitute resolution. Initially, what came out of the marriage task force was the passage of same-sex marriage being available everywhere, without, irrespective, as it were, of the conscience of the diocesan bishop. A team of people got together that many of the communion partner bishops organized, along with others across the aisle who were on the marriage task force, to try to craft a new resolution that would honor conscience in a way that was not possible with the initial resolution. And so what came up was B012. The resolution, while affirming gay marriage, honors the conscience of the diocesan bishop who bears the responsibility of defining what it means to be, quote, one with the apostles, unquote, and the charge to, quote, guard the faith unity and discipline of the church, unquote. Our diocese anticipated this action, and I called for a task force to examine the theological and pastoral issues surrounding the possibility of the church performing same-sex marriages. The task force was chaired by Canon Justin Holcomb, and he and the task force did a very fine job. I highly recommend their report, which each of you should have already received via email. You should also note that a gathering to discuss the content of that report will be held at Church of the Ascension on Thursday evening, Thursday, February 21st at 7 p.m. All are welcome, but you are urged to RSVP via the link sent in the email to let them know in advance of your coming so that they can make sure that there is appropriate seating and refreshments. I will not go over the content of the task force in this address. That would take up the entire address. I should say that one of, the recomm one of their recommendations is that the clergy honor the plan that I have developed for the implementation of B012 regarding gay marriage. I had announced that plan previously, but I want to quickly summarize it. One, both the rector and the congregation should be in agreement that their parish should be a place where gay marriages are performed. In other words, it can't be just the decision of either the priest or the congregation. They have to come together. Those rites are to be performed strictly in accordance with the liturgical rites already approved by general convention. Three, the rector and congregation should appeal to their bishop for permission to be able to perform these rites. Four, the remaining members of the Diocese of Central Florida, the diocesan bishop shall, and that's the verb used in the resolution, assign that congregation and their clergy to the pastoral care of another bishop who supports the implementation of these rites. All of these policies point are in complete alignment with B012. So far, one congregation has made such an appeal, and I have recommended a bishop for them to contact. So far, that bishop, with whom I have a very good relationship, and with whom I am in regular contact, and that conversation at this point are in conversation, but as of the writing of this address, I have received no communication from that bishop to indicate that this is firm. It has to be said, 
uh, I'm sorry, it has been the sense among the clergy on the task force that while some favor gay marriage, almost all would refrain from performing them at this time because they in fact want to remain under the pastoral care of their diocesan bishop. I deeply admire and respect their generosity and humility that was exhibited among the task force. Living in a church that appears at this point to be in two minds about something as important as the doctrine of marriage is genuinely difficult. In fact, I am deeply and even emotionally conflicted about even implementing this resolution. But I've agreed to do so because I am fully committed to our staying together as a church. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Mike, Michael Ramsey, described the Anglican Communion as, quote unquote, untidy. I, I like that classic British understatement. Historically, Anglicanism has always been more loyal to its structures than all of its theological definitions. This is not new. We do, in fact, want to find a way to remain together, even in the face of theological disagreements, trusting that others, perhaps even our successors, will find a way to fix the places that are presently where we are not united. We, you see, are in for the long haul, and that includes me. If I didn't believe that with all of my heart, I could never in good conscience ordain many of the young people who are coming to us to be a part of that process. I am not a bishop who says, okay, I've got five years, which is true, by the way, and then I'm out, so I'm just going to coast. I am committed fully to preparing and raising up, God being our helper, an Orthodox evangelical diocese that in fact makes room for the many young adults for whom this is a place for them to celebrate, give thanks, and to serve faithfully in the life of what we have received as an Episcopal church. If I wasn't committed to that, I couldn't perform these ordinations. It would be, in fact, disingenuous of me to be able to do so. That is why I've agreed to serve on the Episcopal Church's National Communion Across Differences Task Force and definitely plan to attend the Lambeth Gathering of Anglican Bishops in 2020. What we share together is far more important and weighty than what divides us. Such a situation requires, and I want to say that first and foremost of me, but I think of all of us, requires significant intercession, genuine humility, gentleness, and the capacity to listen beyond slogans in a way that allows us to hear another's heart. I will keep the diocese updated on how all of this progresses. Another significant action at General Convention for which some of our deputation was in part responsible, especially Father Jose Rodriguez, as well as Bishop Lloyd Allen of Honduras, was the call to make good on Convention's promise to be a fully bilingual church. No one, especially in the publication of our documents, there has been a feeling among many in Hispanic deputations that they were only needed for quote-unquote inclusive window dressing, unquote, and not taken seriously, especially with cultural and theological differences that mark these growing and evangelically dynamic dioceses. I can tell you they were heard exclamation point. In fact, at one point, Bishop Allen just stopped business at the House of Bishops. It couldn't have been more wonderful. It was, it's just an honor to stand with these Hispanic brothers and sisters. Important work continues in serving the many Hispanics that come into Central Florida, much of which is now organized by the Hispanic Commission under the excellent and creative leadership of Father Jose Rodriguez. Money has come in from Episcopal Relief Development, Trinity Church Wall Street, and even Starbucks. And I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you have donations of food, clothing, or supplies that would assist them in their relief efforts, please contact Father Jose directly. The pace, as I referred to earlier this year, has been breakneck. Since our last convention, I have participated in over 80 events in our diocese. I have made 42 parish visits, baptizing 21 people, confirming 312, receiving 159, and 22 reaffirmations. 
Diocesan events include, besides parish gatherings, youth gatherings, celebrations of new ministry, visits to our diocesan schools, to which I continue to be deeply and profoundly committed, as well as ordinations, Daughters of the King Fall Assembly, Alta Guild, and Episcopal Church Women. I also have been asked by Christina Jackson, who is now the national president of the Daughters of the King. Congratulations, Christina. She asked me to serve as their nat national chaplain. You know, she was a little sneaky. She said it wouldn't take much. But I want you to know, to be around this powerhouse of intercessors is both humbling and amazingly challenging. I feel like the guy in the room that's there to wash feet. I continue as well to participate in the leadership of communion partners, both nationally and at times overseas. I had the joy of participating in a leadership conference organized by the Diocese of Dallas and the Diocese of Central Florida called Radical Vocation that brought together over 500 young adults from across the country to explore ordination in the Episcopal Church. That number is unprecedented. It was one of the largest conferences of its kind in the Episcopal Church, and the key organizers were Canon Justin Holcomb and Canon Jeremy Bergstrom, who at the time was on the staff of the Diocese of Dallas, now rector of St. Peter's Lake Mary. Welcome, Peter. Speakers included, yeah. Speakers included the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, Archbishop Josiah Fearon, Doctors Oda Oliver O'Donovan, the Re Right Reverend Dr. N.T. Wright, Ephraim Radner, and Stanley Hauerwas. It was a blockbuster lineup. While all of this activity is behind me, thank God, I'm thinking about the future, and I'm also looking forward to a real break. In the last several months, the clergy staff of the diocese, myself included, have gone through a 360 review under the leadership of Mr. Lyle Wells of Integris in Austin, Texas. Mr. Wells is a strong Christian whose clients are typically large universities and multi-million dollar businesses. But through a series of conversations and connections, we caught Lyle Wells' attention, and he agreed to come and serve us with his expertise. It has been profoundly challenging and an absolute delight. All of the clergy staff members, as well as Sarah Caprani, my executive assistant, have been deeply and positively affected by his insights his little nudges, and his serious challenges. Under his leadership, we are working to redefine how we as a diocesan staff lead and how we lead together. And his leadership has been a tremendous influence to help us think creatively about the role of the next canon to the ordinary. It's clear the job is pretty big. So we're trying to find a way, which is why we've even created these teams now under Canon Holcomb, to provide in a broader sense the kind of support each of our congregations need, especially in times of conflict or transition. We have also come up with three points of emphasis when I think about the future of the diocese. These are things that have already been started, but they are things that I want to continue to underscore. First of all, what I want to continue to underscore the centrality of mission in the Diocese of Central Florida. A part of the hope for our revival meeting last night was to set a pace, not just to offer a one-time event. I hope it raises questions for you in your congregation so that you begin to ask amongst yourselves, how might God continue to shape us, meaning our congregation, so that we focus more on how we bring, quote, those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, third Collect for Missions prayer book. Is it not true that if one looks at the New Testament, the missional focus is at the heart of what it means to be church? So how might our Sunday morning worship services, as well as our day-to-day -day programs, be reshaped so that more and more people have the opportunity to say yes to him? Quoting the canticle, splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right. O Lamb that was slain. 
I was at the 730 Eucharist this morning under the able leadership of Bishop Frank Gray. And he raised the question about why were we here? Now, while he was making a law grace comment, immediately two things came to mind in my own heart. First of all, I was here at the Eucharist this morning because I need it. I need to be fed by both the communion of God's people as well as the sacrament that is given in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I am hungry. But I am also there because it is God's right to receive from his redeemed people the splendor, honor, and kingly power that is due him. Worship at its heart is actually an effort to give back to God that which is due him in praise and worship. It is not about consumerism in me getting what I want. Now, hopefully you are, in fact, being fed by your local churches, but literally quite apart from that. We gather together, standing at the altar of God every single Sunday because we owe it to him. We owe it to him because of what it is that God has so graciously done for us. Number two, I want to underscore an approach both to the raising up of leaders as well as developing the life of our congregation that more and more looks genuinely multicultural to become what our presiding bishop has called the beloved community. I'm not talking about being colorblind. That's actually a mistake but actually color diverse. We now have, and perhaps for the first time, some clergy leaders who do not represent the majority race of the congregation they serve. This is an important step in the right direction, but it is only a step. If the vision of the kingdom of the, for those who have been redeemed by his blood from every tribe, tongue, language, people, and nation. This requires of our congregations an intentional going to, not merely waiting for people to come to us, especially people who do not look like those who worship with us on Sunday. Otherwise, how will they know that they are in fact welcome? Because many assume if they don't look like us, they're not welcome. How do we extend the invitation? How do we find ways to greet and welcome people who in fact do not look like us and celebrate the cultural diversity rather than pulling them into especially an Anglo norm? We don't do that very well. We're happy to welcome people of color in Anglo congregations if they act white. But it's, that is not the same as respecting and honoring how God has worked through each individual culture and that there is values and grace and actually things this Anglo boy needs to learn from cultures that are not like mine. All of us have those lenses. I mean, who am I? Anglo, upper middle class. East Coast, Southern. All of those are lenses that I use to be able to look at life that have been cultivated to, with, to me from the very beginning. To quote South Pacific, you have to be carefully taught. And I was. And it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to literally pull apart those assumptions without dissing the values of the culture that God gave you and learn to see something that's broader, that looks more like the kingdom rather than my highest ideal for the Episcopal Church, which may or may not look like me at all. There's a cartoon I used to have on my wall of my office, and it's long gone, and I regret it. I've said it before, I think. An old Anglo dowager at the door greeting her rector, and she says something to the effect of, what is all this talk about evangelism? Everybody in this town who ought to be an Episcopalian already is one. <laughs> you need to know that in many places that really is our reputation. And many of our congregations warmly embrace all sorts and conditions, and others actually have reputations that are not particularly kind. So how will they know they are welcome unless we go out of our way to extend the invitation? 
Number three, provide additional support, training, and encouragement for our clergy who often feel isolated and alone. The pastoral care and discipleship of our clergy who serve in our congregations continues to be one of my highest priorities. But as any clergy person will tell you, if he or she does that job well, it both hurts as well as heals. Eugene Peterson, in his book, Under the Tender Plant, Peculiar Plant, sorry, described this vocation as a storm. He puts it this way. Storms expose our lives to the brooding, hovering wind of the Spirit of God. In the storm, we are reduced to what is elemental, but that ultimate elemental is God. Our vocations are God-called and God-shaped life work. And the moment we drift away from dealing with God, we are in fact no longer living vocationally, no longer living in a conscious, willing, participatory relationship with this vast reality called God. The storm either exposes the futility of our work without God's power, or it confirms it. God constitutes our work, and it disabuses us of any suggestion that in our work, we can avoid or even manipulate God in prayer. Once that is established, we're in fact then ready, and sometimes it takes a while, to learn the spirituality that is actually adequate to our vocation. Working truly, sometimes fearlessly, sometimes cautiously, God being our helper without ambition or anxiety, and without denial or sloth. In other words, true leadership is, in fact, the fruit of being winnowed in the fire of God's change agent, the discipline that is mentioned of God in Hebrews. I want to continue to work and pray for our clergy who often find themselves in the storm of their vocation. And it is precisely because of that storm that I'm taking the diocese up on their very kind offer in providing for me a sabbatical. I will be away starting April Fool's Day. <laughs> a hint from God, I believe. And will return at the end of June. Fathers Jim Servillo and Scott Holcomb have taken the helm in raising the money to cover the costs of the sabbatical, and I'm profoundly grateful for their sacrificial willingness to help make this happen. I think of the sabbatical as both a quest and a pilgrimage, the goal of which is, to quote Peterson, to discover anew the spirituality adequate to this vocation. I plan to delve deeply into the vocation of what it means to be a bishop, both historically as well as within our contemporary context. I plan to read extensively, as well as to have conversations with other bishops I know about what they are learning in their vocations. Laura Lee and I will be traveling together, spending part of that time in England and Ireland, including two weeks walking, hiking, the Canterbury Trail from Winchester to Canterbury Cathedral. My wife, Laura Lee, known to many as the hat lady, <laughs> continues to be a singular companion and love that I deeply treasure. I cannot tell you how thankful I am that she and I are in this together. Thank you. <laughs> when Bill Falwell addressed the convention of 1970, he told the diocese to, quote, expect to have your life changed, unquote. That is actually my hope in this sabbatical, to have my life changed, to know more about the intimate and life-altering power of Jesus Christ, and come away with a clearer understanding of how God wants me to spend the next and last five years of my episcopate as a diocesan bishop. We should all pray and hope that both our personal lives and the lives of our congregations are changed and continue to be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit as we continue to move forward in mission together. It is an adventure and not for the faint of heart. But God promises that as we wait on him, we will rise with wings as eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. And should we grow weary, the Holy Spirit who never leaves us is so kind to pick us up, bolster us again with his love, 
and keep us moving forward. And so to him who sits on the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship, praise, dominion, and splendor forever and forevermore. Thank you again for the profound privilege of being able to love and serve this incredible diocese. Thank you.